the talk is over. <laughs> so um, I hope you had as exerting uh, a lunchtime break as I did. Uh, I'm going to mention what I did at lunch. I don't see Esther here. Oh, Esther, oh, there she is. Okay. So Esther Hargitay and David Hafiker and myself went on a geocaching. So how many of you know about geocaching? Oh, oh my God, everyone. And we were successful as well. We did a lot of fun. But it was, it kept us down to the wire to come back here in time. And uh, had a nice little space for the walk that we took there, etc. And I'm going to uh, mention two things about this. One now, and one I'll mention at a later point in the talk. The first thing I'm going to mention is that, as many of you know, that people, very often you have people. Is Nancy here? Yeah. Sorry, there's more than one Nancy. Is that any <laughs> so, um, one of the things I've discovered is that people like us who are in technologies and who have a lot of interest in doing these things as a hobby often find a way of taking our hobbies and then justifying it as research and getting involved in it, etc. And Esther is an example of that. You know, she got interested in geocaching, was intrigued by it, and then now justifies it as a professional activity because she's written an article um, on geocaching. Uh, which I think was titled Cash Me If You Can. Is that the title of the article? And so, and I was thinking about that and I said, who else do I know who does this? And then it came to mind that Nancy Bain is another person who does this. I know Nancy from when she was a grad student at Illinois. I was there for 20 years before moving to Northwestern five years ago. And Nancy was really obsessed, you don't mind me saying this, Nancy, about keeping track of rats. <laughs> and by rats, I mean radio and television soap operas. <laughs> and uh, she got so involved in it that at some point she had to justify to her mom and everyone else around her, her colleagues, why she was spending all this time looking at, you know, reading about it online, etc. And the next thing you know, Nancy's dissertation is on rats and how people react to, uh, to doing discussion threads about it. So there's a lesson there for many of you that you can take your technology uh, addictions and convert them into a professional activity. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about some assembly required. This is, I've been on sabbatical this past year, and I'm working on a book uh, with the same title. Uh, not the same subtitle, I don't know, but the same title, Some Assembly Required. And it's about how we assemble teams from uh, networks, and how these teams in turn then influence the networks that we belong to. So I'm going to share a little bit with you about those ideas here. I'm going to go through pretty fast so that I can hopefully spend some, save some time for questions. So many of you have, some of you, the senior scholars in the room have seen this, so bear with me. Uh, may have heard, how do you get the laser? Yeah, so this thing called the Love Getty. How many of you know about the Love Getty other than listening to it from me? Okay, almost nobody. Oh, a couple of people do, okay. Uh, so the Love Getty is this little toy that was very popular about 10 years ago in Japan. In Osaka, all the kids would wear this little Love Getty on their belts, and it was basically, do you remember the Tomagachi? Some of you remember that? It's kind of like that, but the big difference. The Love Getty is a device which you program with the kind of music movies that you like and the kind of music and movies that you might want in uh, a love party. And then you wear this. So this is kind of bring, bring, going back to this morning's discussion about chemistry.com and eHarmony, etc. But this was a hardware solution to that. You program this in your little thing there. And you walk around the streets in Japan. And anytime your Love Getty starts flashing or beeping or buzzing, you look around to see who around you is also flashing or beeping or buzzing, and then you know that you've made a sort of love connection that comes out of that. Um, you might wonder why am I going to be talking about romancing issues? I'm not by no means an expert on studying it or uh, necessarily practicing it, but I'm going to move on next to another one which is even goes a little more downhill, and that is SNF. And this is called SNF because it's social networking and fur. So it's for dogs, and you see that's what you see out there. You see these little dogs. And it's a little device that you put on the collar of the dog. And you put it on the collar of the dog, and it, with each time it meets another dog that has the same thing, like they do here, the two dogs' little USB infrared thingamajiggy exchange business card information about the dogs. So, you know, and at the end of the day, you take the collar off, and then you plug this in to your laptop, and you go on the web, and you see the um, network of all the dogs that your dog likes to hang out with. And then you can click on any of those dogs and find out who the owner is. And then this was developed in the Media Lab at MIT. And so the article in Wired Magazine, which featured the story, said you could set up dog dates. And they, of course, for those of you who know Wired, they like their geek speak. They went even one step too far for them, I think, and say, oh, this makes a move from social networking to social networking. <laughs> Okay, so why am I starting with two examples? I actually am talking about it because the two examples talk about something that is becoming increasingly common. Our desire and our aspiration to use technology, not just to communicate and collaborate with people, 
but to find the right people to communicate or collaborate with. That was true in finding romantic partners, it was true in finding dark dates, and as David Ferrucci wrote in the New York Times earlier this year, uh, this is a beautiful article if you want to take a look at it. Are all of you familiar with Watson, Jeopardy, IBM? Yeah. So, um, David Ferrucci was the head of the team that came up with Watson. And he wrote this article in the New York Times earlier this year saying that you may think that, you know, building Watson was a challenge technologically, but the bigger challenge for me was building the team that built Watson, which is the title of this article in the New York Times. And so we clearly see that there is a need for us to do better at building teams. Some of us are successful, like David, and others not so successful. And I'm going to have to use my arrow. Does this have a USB thing or nothing like that? Um, okay. So in fact, there's a lot of work. This was an article published in Science by my colleagues Brian Uzi and uh, collaborators, which shows that more and more work is being done in teams. So they looked at all the articles that were published in the Web of Science over the last 30 years, and they looked at this about 20 million articles as well as patents. And what they found was that increasingly articles that are being published are written by teams, that is multiple authors, in all areas, including the social sciences, even the humanities, the green line here. Not only is it being in use, it not only are we working more in teams, but finding number two is that teams that uh, get higher citations than individual articles. And the cynic in all of us says, well, of course, if each of the authors cites their own article, it's going to get more. It turns out the control for self citation, and you still have this high impact of articles done by teams. Finding number three, articles done by teams from people from different disciplines have an even higher impact than those that are done in a single discipline. And finding number four, articles that are done by teams from different disciplines and different universities have an even higher impact than those that are done from different disciplines but from the same university. And so you look at these findings and you go, well, I guess we now know everything we need to do. Uh, we are already here in this transdisciplinary set of workshops. So all you got to do for the next week out here is find other people that you want to work with. Uh, make sure they're from a different discipline, from a different university, and you're all good to go. Well, not quite so fast. It turns out that while, whoops, <laughs> this is a reminder for the right thing, but nonetheless. So, the move, there's, uh, so this was the move to virtual team science, meaning distributed uh, locations as well. But while this was happening, uh, Jonathan Cummings, who's at Duke, and his collaborator Sarah Kiesler at Carnegie Mellon, have done a series of studies looking at NSF projects, and what they found was that, in general, the more interdisciplinary an NSF project and the more distributed, geographically distributed it was, the less likely it was to be successful. So you think this is a paradox, and it's actually not a paradox, because what it's really saying is that most of the time, interdisciplinary, geographically distributed work fails. But when it succeeds, on the few occasions when it succeeds, it succeeds spectacularly. And that's the bias that you see in the published materials of the Web of Science. And so part of what our goal and my goal here is to try to understand how can we make the teams more like the stuff that, that Brian Uzi and uh, Ben Jones found in, in the Web of Science and less like the projects that were dominating in the data set that uh, Jonathan Cummings and Sarah Kiesler had. So what I'm going to argue here is four takeaways, and that is understanding and enabling TMSP, which is my abbreviation, obviously our abbreviation for technological media social participation, that understanding this and enabling it, and that's the intervention, I know Ben used the word intervention, I think of understanding and enabling as the two phrases, that we are really well poised to make a lot of improvement in this area for four reasons. Because for the first time we have good social science theories that already tell us a lot, but leave new questions still to be addressed in research. We have methods that are better than what we've had, a panoply of methods ranging from ethnographic qualitative to some pretty advanced inferential network analytic techniques that I'll talk a little bit more about today. The third is that we have data, obviously. We have big data. We also have what I think is more accurately referred to as broad data. This is Jim Hendler's word. He says we don't have big data, we have broad data because you are able to take data from diverse sources and collate them in ways that we were never able to do before. And then finally, fourth, we have the computational infrastructure with better scale and cloud that allow us to do that. I'm not going to talk much about the fourth one. I'm going to focus on the top three during this talk. So, um, why do we create, I mean, this is a general question, why do we create the links we do? I mean, later on, I'm going to ask the question, why do we team up with the people we team up with? What is the motivation for doing that? And I have this picture from last year, taken right outside this building. And it was taken right after that earthquake that we have talked about. <laughs> and I thought it would be appropriate to talk about this today because what you see in this picture is that people were befuddled. But what you may not be able to see very clearly is that not only some people are talking to each other, but a lot of the people are on their cell phones and mobile phones and smartphones talking to other people. 
And so the question is, this is a great way to capture at that moment when you had a crisis like the earthquake, who you're going to call, right? So it's that sort of thing. It tells you the motivation. Sorry, see, they don't get that. But it's too long, right? <laughs> Ghostbusters. So, so it's it's this idea of how what's the motivation to do it. So in a book that Peter Manji and myself and uh, wrote, and then Stanley Wasserman and Katie Faust uh, and I wrote a subsequent piece in the Academy of Management Review. We looked at what are the motivations for what could be for technologically immediate social participation. And we basically categorized the literature that we reviewed into a few categories. One is self-interest. I'm going to reach out to Mark because I want something that Mark has. So it's my self-interest, and that's why I'm going to reach out. Or, of course, Mark may not answer my calls or my Skype calls and Skype messages. And so that's because it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works, but in many cases it may not work. The theory of, it's an economic model, right? I'm trying to maximize my individual utility function. The second is a social exchange model. So this is more like a market model, which says that I want to create a link with, where's Jenny? Oh, my hands are stuck behind. She, she had to step up. Oh, there she is. OK. So I want to get something from Jenny, but I know that Jenny also wants something from me. So we set up a social exchange. And that's another way, then, to be able to, why am I create a link with someone? I want something from them, and I know they want something from me. The third one says, I don't want anything from Ben, and Ben doesn't want anything from me. But we know that getting together, we have a better shot of getting something from a third party. So any collective action, any lobbying effort, any setting of standards, all of that would fall under that. So these are different motivations of creating links. The ones on the right are less strategic than the ones on the left. The one on the right says, theories of contagion, that the, the reason I want to talk to Bernie Hogan is because I look around and everyone wants to talk to Bernie Hogan, right? So he's a very popular guy. And so I feel like I'm a stranger in this group. I should go talk to the one person that everyone talks to. And that's why Bernie Hogan, they're the rich get richer. People who have more network ties get even more network ties. I only said that to make sure that Bernie was listening and paying attention. Ghostbusters. <laughs> that's good. I'm glad it takes time. <laughs> Another reason, another thing that could happen is that people are creating links because of balance, because your friends are friends, right? So I know Bernie, and then Bernie will introduce me to the next great star uh, in, in, in the web world, because he knows all these people, and I'm friends with them and know something about them. Is it necessarily a good thing? Not necessarily. If that person is really going to say something interesting, I could just get it from, where, from Bernie, and instead I could spend my time talking to people who are not connected to people that I'm connected with, because they may bring me more novel information. Um, homophily, birds of a feather. So this goes back to my story of the geocache and also our morning introductions. When we did the morning introductions, did you notice how we would have these clusters of people from the same institution, one after the other, sitting next to each other, right? And why were they hanging out together? Because it's comfortable to talk to people like yourself. And I normally say that having said this now, I really would request you to mess with the next time where we have people like Bernie. Remember Bernie said this morning, or so-and-so, when he gave a lecture here three days ago, he was sitting there, and he was sitting there, and she was sitting there. I think you need to shuffle things up and not sit next to people you know, because theories of homophily, while it's good news in terms of being able to talk to people like yourself, it's bad news because that's not where creative ideas come from, and you're not here to talk to people like yourself. Having said that, I plead guilty that on the one day I'm here today, because I have to leave this evening, sadly, um, on the one day that I'm here, I take the whole lunch break, I hang out with two people that I know pretty well, <laughs> Esther, who's my colleague at uh, Northwestern, and David, who was my colleague at Northwestern as a graduate student before he went to greener pastures and better climate. So it's easy to fall into the habit of homophily, but it's not always necessarily the best thing to do. Uh, though I had a pretty good time, Esther, and David, just in case. <laughs> Proximity says people, you talk to, like to talk to people who are close by to you. So having sat next to each other, you're obviously more likely to talk to each other. And you might say, well, in technology, you can talk to anyone, anytime, any place, And that's all true. But the fact of the matter is that even with technologies today, we forget that we use technologies inordinately more to actually communicate with people who are close by to us. The biggest applications of using things like Skype, etc., are to talk to people in the same city, in the same building, on the same floor, in the same dorm rooms. There's lots of good research that shows that. And while technology allows us to talk to people elsewhere, we use it inordinately just to control a lot of our proximate communication. So all of these things are still relevant today as we move forward. The nice thing is that each of these theories that I talked about have unique structural signatures. By that I mean that if you have, um, if, if people are operating on the basis of self-interest, you'll see certain kinds of structural configurations in the network that are more likely to happen than by random chance. This is the easiest one to show is the exchange. If there's a solid line from A to F, there's a greater likelihood of a link from F to A, social exchange. 
as opposed to a link from D to C. So what is nice about this is that if each of these theories has a unique structural signature, then in, when you get an observed network, like some of the networks we saw this morning, in those mangled networks, we can use techniques that you can think of them as statistical macroscopes, if you may, or statistical MRIs, and that allow you to be able to, oops, sorry, who am I doing here? Uh, that allow you to, hold on a second, did I? These are slides that I didn't want to have time to go to, so I'm a little confused. Whoops. I seem to have, that's back to this one, sorry. So let's wave the rose around too. Make it button. Wave the rose around too. Is it you can wave the rose around too? Like the rose? No, no, I'm not. I'm just gonna. I'm, okay, so here's the statistical MRI. So you can look at those signatures and be able to identify which of those theories may be operating in certain conditions, right? So in other words, you can. I can do a network analysis uh, using the using Facebook and my. My gen dev now, not my gen web, is that right? Uh, yeah, our name gen dev is name gen. that's not broken yeah. okay. as of last week. Right, so you. when you do that, I can look at the noodly spaghetti network of this and say, is this network is being driven 15% by self-interest, 20% by homophily, 54% uh, by social exchange, and so on and so forth. So I'm able to understand what drives this particular network in ways that I wouldn't have been able to do before. Uh, this is talks about statistically testing this. I'm not going to talk much more about it, but there's some nice statistical models that have come up. Where's Zach? Zach's advisor, Carter Butts at uh, UC Irvine, is one of the leaders in setting up these really interesting statistical techniques called P-star or exponential random graph models that allow you to test for those signatures and be able to analyze data in some very creative new ways. Now, of course, we have theory, we have methods. The challenge has always been of empirically testing these theories. And of course, uh, here I'm going to use slides that already made very reference to this morning about the Hubble telescope. These are slides that David Lazar, who's at Northeastern, um, shared with me. It's a wonderful set of way of describing our case. He says, if you're an astronomer, you have a Hubble telescope, you know, you spend you get all the data you want and you spend $2.5 billion and you're able to, you know, you're in data heaven as a result. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and if you're a particle physicist, then you've got the Hadron Collider or the CERN Particle Accelerator. It's a billion dollars a year, but that gives you all the data that you want. And that's a way in which you do it. But what if you're a web scientist? What if you're a scientist like someone in this room, etc.? Well, this is what we have. It's priceless, <laughs> sort of, because we obviously have all kinds of privacy issues, etc. But it is, in fact, the place for a lot of where we are going to be rely on extensively to be able to analyze uh, the kinds of questions that we want to address in this area. So as I look at it from my lens, the web today has helped us create this multi-dimensional network where some of the nodes are people, some of the nodes are documents, some of the nodes are data sets, some of the nodes are analytic tools, and we have links amongst all of these people, people to people co-authoring, people to documents, documents have keywords, so they have links between documents and keywords. You create this incredible phishing fishnet web, and you want to be able to pick up any one node and see how it's connected to other nodes. Or you might be wanting to pick up any particular, uh, and, and the node that I might pick up here for me might be different from the neighborhood that will show up for you because where we are in the network is different. So we will think about having recommender systems along these lines that allow us to say that if Ben logs in and says he's interested in topic A, it might recommend uh, person X, document Y, and data set C. But if um, David Huffaker breaks up the network and asks the same topic, he'll get a different set of recommendations based upon where each of us are in the network and given the motivations that we talked about there. So, of course, what has helped a lot with this recently is this notion of linked open data, right? Where a lot of the data that we have today on the web, you know, we have web pages that are linked, but we don't have data that has been linked until relatively recently. And that's a large part of what this multidimensional network is. And so people like Jim Henlow, who used to be at Maryland, who was one of Ben's colleagues here, now at RPI, um, is, uh, has been championing the idea of linked open data, where data that is made available is linked to other data sets, and it creates this incredible way in which not just having pages, but you have deep data that is linked with one another and makes it into a broad data set, not just a big data set. So that's a large part of what is happening. When it's first started out, you see that a lot of the data that was then started with the DBpedia, that some of you would know about database with Wikipedia, and then you had all these uh, data sets, your online activities, publications, life sciences, geography, and music. As you move, you see a couple of years later, and it's, got, it's really exploded. 
So this is something that we should think about as a way of understanding the network of data that has been created that accompanies a network of people that we have been typically studying on the web. So obviously, this was, I don't know if many of you have seen this, but these are all the kinds of activities that we do on the, man, on the web. This was something based on 60 seconds on the web and the amount of time we spent. 168 million emails are sent, about 700,000 search queries, and so on and so forth. It gives you the scope of what the different kinds of activities in which we interact with the web. So on the basis of this, I, mean, I talked about David Lazar. David Lazar and his colleagues, um, uh, and, and myself included here, we wrote an article in Science a few years ago that talked about the fact that we have this new thing called computational social science. And computational social science is an approach that complements what are the other forms of social science. So it doesn't take away from experiments, it doesn't take away from uh, uh, large-scale surveys or survey-based data, but it's a new quiver, in our, uh, a new arrow in our quiver, if you may, to look at it. And I think it's particularly useful uh, and I, this is a separate talk that, I've been, that I'm actually going to give at Oxford in a couple of weeks, uh, on can big data motivate new theories and data and, and, and new methods. So it gives us an opportunity to actually think about new theories that we have, that go beyond what we had uh, looked at previously. So what I want to talk about substantively then is in that as a backdrop is to say that if I want to look at teams, and I can think of four levels at which this was analyzed, I will say that last year when I did this talk, I talked about some things that were similar to this, but I only had three levels then. So this year I added a fourth level based on some research that we've done in the past year. So when you look at teams, people who study teams, some of them look at it as composition. So they look at it as a collection of individuals, right? So it just, you take all the people and say, well, how does, you know, gender diversity in the team affect something, for example? So that's a compositional variable. People who do network stuff move to the relational level. That's the second one there. And in the relational level, you start asking questions, how are the connections between people in the team going to influence the performance of the team? And the third category is to say, you can look at the people, and then you can look at the task they're doing, and create a bimodal network. That is to say, I'm going to see how these people relate to these tasks, and to what extent are teams assembled around certain artifacts, like Wikipedia pages, for example. And then the fourth one is to what extent these are overlapping teams, because we recognize in the world we have teams that overlap. People are on multiple teams at the same time, and they come in and out of teams. To what extent are your teams in ex external connection, not internal connection as we saw out here, but external ties with other teams in the ecosystem of teams, how does that influence your performance of your team? Okay. So these are, I'm going to give some quick examples that run through all of these approaches. I'm going to give several examples here. The first one will be a, a, from a project that we've been doing on virtual worlds. Uh, virtual worlds is um, uh, people who play online games who come together. Uh, I know it sounds very frivolous. At least I know Jenny thinks it sounds very frivolous. She's given me a hard time about this on a couple of occasions. Um, because, you know, why not, why not we study important societal problems rather than study, seeing people who play silly games online? Yeah, and but Jenny have you been written up right? in a congressional report yet? Make a Have you been written up in a congressional <laughs> Three report? Three of them. There you go. <laughs> and some and, marker. and right. I say that with pride because huh? some of my best colleagues, like Nicole Ellison, who was not here, but was here last year, and many others were also written up in those reports. And I know why you are sensitive about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a sense of the time when this happened. But actually, it's jokes aside, and I, Jenny's right, but I think that there are some really interesting insights that we can get about the serious issues that you want by looking at those. And the question, of course, pivots on do we think that people's behaviors are, how many of you know about World of Warcraft or other massively multiplayer? Oh, I would love this girl. <laughs> no explanation required. Um, so, you know, what can we learn from people's play? Can that really translate into serious work? Well, our research shows that in many cases it translates quite well when we have done that kind of work. And we are not alone in this respect. There was an article that was published in Harvard Business Review. Uh, that by Byron Reeves and Tom Malone, uh, Tom Malone and Tony Driscoll, where they make the case that actually studying this is important not only because it has the kinds of expertise that you would expect to, uh, you know, that the findings there would generalize here, but the second reason is because many of our young uh, colleagues today are playing those games and learning leadership skills there. And so for those of you who have played on one of these games, um, you know that you get together in guilds, and guilds go on these big quests, or people from guilds go on these big quests or raids that could be 70, 80 people, and it's often coordinated by some 13-year-old guy somewhere. And so they are learning their leadership skills. So being able to understand this is good in and of itself, and also because it translates into other cases. So I'm going to take two cases. We have data from Sony Online Entertainment, which I'm going to talk about here. It's a game called EverQuest 2. It's like World of Warcraft. And the basic idea is, we were interested in asking two questions. 
how does the virtual team composition influence the group outcomes? And the second is, what are the motivations for creating this? So the first one is, in that slide of ours, it's at that compositional level. So this particular one was a project that I did with my now former student, Mu Xiao, uh, who just got a job as a postdoc at Rutgers in communication and computer science there. And so we were looking at, com at combat groups in EverQuest 2. These are groups that come together to go kill something, kill a monster, right? And we looked at one week of data. This is server-side data, so it's server logs. And this is dream data for people who do group research, right? 8,400 players, 46,000 plus groups, 9 million combats. That's the kind of data we can dream of when you want to study group behavior. And what did we find? We basically hypothesized that the diversity of the group will impact performance and that the group member's cosmopolitan level, that is the group member has played with a lot of other different types of people in other groups, that that might affect it. So this is sort of like that external group connection because they bring experience from all those groups. Well, what did we find? Well, first of all, I should say that performance is very nicely measured in these games. They have four measures of how many points you gain, how many non-player characters or monsters you kill, how much you gain in level for you, and how many times you die in the game. Because as you know, in these games, you can get killed and then you come back after a while. So it's death, so it's a negative measure of performance, if you will. And what did we find? Well, we found that diversity, in fact, does help the group to achieve more. So if you have a group that has people from different class characters, so these are people who could be fighters or mage or priest, and as you have more diverse groups, you improve experience points, you improve non-player character, and you improve your level game. So it does make a difference, the compositional diversity in the group. Interestingly, the cosmopolitan also makes a difference, but for a different one, for depth. In other words, people, group, people that have in groups, when people have played with a lot of other different types of people, so people who are cosmopolitan, it doesn't help you gain positive performance, but it helps protect you against negative performance indicators, like being killed. So that's an example of how we can think about compositional level as affecting it. Running quickly to a relational level, and here we're looking at the links between people and seeing how those links might affect it. Here, this was a project I did with Yun Wong, who's a postdoc in my lab, Wong Shao, who's at who's now at Rutgers, Brian, who's uh, up as headed to the postdoc to Northeastern, and Jeff Treem, who just started, took a job at UT Austin. You can see there's a lot of churn amongst the people who are leaving uh, Northwestern at this point, just as we welcome new people like Cindy to joining Northwestern. So in this case, we had network data from the game to see how these people in a technologically immediate way were coming together to participate socially. So uh, the data for this was just 3,000 players, very small data set. Uh, taken from across the, from the U.S. server, and we were asking questions about this particular uh, set of networks. So this is the partnership networks. Who do you play with in the game? Who do you join to? So this is where you come together and say, why do I team up with some other person? What is the, what is the motivation for teaming up with them? This is the IMing network. This is who you mail with, where you can mail. It's different from IM because you can actually mail things, and it's not only really artifacts within the game. And this one is the trade network. When you look at the, the trade network is when you can buy and sell goods in the game. So as you know, you can buy things to make, get, make yourself better weapons and get, get yourself better armory and so on and so forth, or buy medicine to heal yourself. And so going back to the partnership network, you'll notice that this in the middle is what is called one large component, sometimes referred to as a giant component. Those who took Mark's known Excel uh, workshop know all of our components and networks, and these are all people. It basically says anyone is connected to anyone else. The black here refers to male, and the red refers to female. And so everyone is connected to somebody. You played with somebody who played with somebody else who played with somebody else. But on the perimeter, you also have these people who only played with two or three others. Can you guess how that happens? Why is it that they only played with a couple of other blacks or a couple of other reds? And that is it. They didn't play with anyone else in the game. Who do you think they are? Any thoughts? Fathers and sons? Yeah. It turns out it's family members. It could be siblings or it could be romantic partners. And they just, they go online to play only with their closest offline friends. Right? So that's that's a large part of what we see out there. That's an important finding because uh, an insight that we'll talk about in a minute more. Because we have this notion that when you have technology, you could communicate with anyone, anytime, any place. And yet the predominant evidence shows us that you're communicating online with the same people that you communicate offline. So when you look at these data then, the trade has a similar kind of story, which is quite interesting. In the trade data set, you see that there's this very heavy, intense, knitted thing inside, right? Who are these people who are constantly traders, etc.? Well, it turns out that in that sort of netting, knitting wool mess there, there are some very interesting insights that Brian Keegan, in particular in my lab, uh, along with some colleagues at the University of Minnesota, have been looking at. And they found that sometimes the people who trade are trading illegally. 
And what do you mean by illegal trade? How many of you know about gold farming? Some of you have heard of gold farming, not as many as World of Warcraft. Well, gold farming is this thing where you play this illegal activity, where it's mostly in China, as it turns out. But as you start with a level one character, and you start playing in the morning, you start playing a new level one character, and you play the character doing repetitive tasks, going and getting things, and getting your, getting your level moved up so that by the end of the day, you move from a level one to a level 70 character. It's a high level character. And now you sell that level 70 character to some lazy Westerner who didn't have the time but has the money to buy a level 70 character so that all of a sudden the game is populated by people who don't know what they're doing but they have a level 70 character, right? So of course the game, uh, the, the, the regular players don't like it and so Sony doesn't like it. And so part of the reason why we were able to get these data from Sony is they asked us, can you help us figure out how to get rid of these people? Can you tell us something about the networks? Well, these are smart people. And so it's not like, you know, if you just say, oh, if I see a stranger who's selling things to a lot of different disparate people, I just knock them out and close down their accounts. No, no, no. They know that's going to happen. So they engage in very uh, surreptitious behaviors. And so it turns out that there are some real interesting structural signatures associated with how a gold farmer will start the character and sell the level 70 character, not initially sell it gift it to a friend who then leaves it in someone's house in the game, who then sells it for a minor price to an accomplice or a fellow accomplice, who then will sell it to the, to the final person, et cetera. So they have these very complex patterns. And we did a study where he compared the structural signatures of people who were gold farmers and found that they had a lot of similarity with the structural signatures of drug trafficking dealers uh, on a data set that was collected in Canada. So what you see here is uh, that there are some really interesting ideas in that you can look for in offline behavior that are being mapped quite well in these online worlds. So what did we find here? We found that, remember back to the question of who do you team up with, selectivity is very important. You don't play randomly with people. You play with friends of friends, so that was a balanced theory. You play with people of the same age and having the same amount of game experience. And you play with people who are, you're 22.6 times more likely to play with someone within 50 kilometers than between 50 and 800 kilometers. Proximity matters again. People are playing with people close by because most of the people they're playing with close by are their offline friends, etc. We also found that time zones matter, that you're 1.25 times more likely to play someone in your same time zone than the next time zone. And oddly, we found that homophily for gender did not matter. In other words, you were not more likely to play with the same gender people. So this is where or we do ethnographers, we have an ethnographer on the team, one of uh, Bernie's friends, uh, Tracy Kennedy. And so Tracy's on our team, and we were puzzled by this finding. And so we had a bunch of people. Tracy was also a web shop that you. Okay. <laughs> and she sat here. And she sat there. <laughs> she sat right behind Mark, that's where I sat. Okay, there you go. <laughs> she sat on Dave's lap, I think. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> Okay, so Tracy and her team of uh, ethnographers were able to find things out. They said, well, it turns out that, it, uh, oh, then we did, we, she asked us the question, well, is it males who don't like to play with males or females who, who don't like to play with females? And we found out males like to play with males. This was, again, part of the analysis. But females were not particularly likely to play with other females. And so then we found out the reason for that. And it turns out that there are many females like this game and they love playing the game. But a vast majority of women who we were talking with and observing, and we asked them why they play the game, it turns out that they play the game not because they like the game, but it's the only way they can hang out with their significant other male partners who <laughs> love the game. So it's the football widow idea, right? That we are about to end the football season and all the women will get disenchanted with it. And so in fact, that was what was happening out here is that many of the women who were, the reason we didn't find this effect is that a lot of women just play the game to hang out with their significant others. And so that's a nice example of how ethnography can work well with uh, computational um, techniques and the kinds we talked about. The third one I'm going to look at is multimodal network levels. So here the idea is we're now uh, saying, how do you, we're leaving the realm of virtual games now, and saying, how can we look at teams like this and see how they're more likely to join a certain task that is there out there? So this was work, again, that I, that I did with, uh, this is Brian's dissertation, by the way. <laughs> And, um, and it's work we did with our colleague at uh, Northwestern, Darren Gurgel. And here what we looked at is how are the teams that come together to, in Wikipedia. In particular, he's interested in breaking news in Wikipedia. So that when you look at the self-organization of teams that come together in the event of a disaster to come and edit a page, you could think of that as a team that comes together. And we wanted to understand a little bit more about how those teams came together. So um, there's really interesting findings about the earthquake that was there that in, the, in, the, in Japan. And if you look at the Wikipedia, the Japanese Wikipedia article was up within 11 minutes of the beginning of the earthquake. The English Wikipedia article was up within 33 minutes, within 90 minutes of the earthquake. Front page of Wikipedia had been vetted by 12 editors, 
In the English article had 220 revisions. This is, yeah, this is within 90 minutes, right? With 82 editors. Articles available were also available in 12 other languages in Wikipedia. And the New York Times had one wire story and one story file. So it gives you a sense of the difference in which technologically media and social participation can make a difference in, in, in this day and age here. So what he looked at here, I'm not going to talk much more about his findings. I'll give a few pretty pictures because this is his dissertation and I want him to be able to preserve the thunder for that. But it shows, it's interesting to see how you can begin to look at the longitudinal nature of the kinds of revisions. So these are the articles that were created, new articles, new revisions, old articles that were revised, articles about earthquakes and now added this piece of information on, etc. And you see, and, and old users, that is new, new people who had never written a Wikipedia article who came online. And you see some very interesting changes in it. The spike that was here is coinciding with when the nuclear disaster happened and there was a new group of people who came on, people who would not have been interested but were experts on <coughs> nuclear uh, materials, etc. So uh, we had all this stuff there. And then you look at the co-authorship by, by, this is a bipartite network. So this is a multimodal network. The blue notes are people, the red notes are Wikipedia pages. The Wikipedia pages are larger. Uh, is this done in this is Node Excel, Excel, right? This is a Node Excel. Yeah, I'm, I'm an early and often user of Node Excel, as Mark knows well. Um, and so what we had here was, and what we did was you had, it was a picture which shows how there's some very really interesting insights that you get here. So that's an article, that's an editor, but this was a big article on earthquake and tsunami. These were pages about towns and cities that were affected by the tsunami. This was about the nuclear accidents. You see that very different types of people were writing these different articles in different areas. And we, and also you have, uh, you know, these are all people, the halo of single article contributors. They only wrote one article and that was it. And then you had some generalists who were contributing to many topics who were writing on a lot of different Wikipedia pages. And then you had specialists who were only contributing to the nuclear crisis idea, for example. Um, this got picked up and one thing that Mark did was, Mark, sorry, Ryan did, was he took these pictures dynamically and created an incredibly powerful video of an animated version of the Node Excel graphics that got picked up in Fortune and Forbes magazine. And so as a grad student, I went to several conferences for the next two months where people said, do you know Brian Keegan? Do you know the famous Brian Keegan? And I was very proud to say, yes, I did know Brian. I'm going to go to the last one here, which is the ecosystem level. The ecosystem level is talking about not staying inside the team. Most of what we've done is looked inside the team to understand how teams come together and why they are uh, why they have a certain performance. In this case, we wanted to see the effect of the ecosystem in which teams go. The base, this is actually taking a bug and making it into a feature. Most research on team says, on teams says, I'm going to assume that people belong to one team and I'm not interested in overlapping teams that contaminates my data. When I do experimental research in the lab, I set it up so that people are by definition in different teams. And in the real world, when I have people who have overlapping teams, I think of that as noise or I try to remove that from the data set because of the dependence problem when you're doing statistical analysis and how do you know whether the person, how that person influenced two different teams. We think it's time to turn that around and be realistic of the fact that in the real world we have teams that overlap and instead of thinking of this as a bug, we need to think about making this into a feature and seeing how that might explain why some teams do better than other teams. So this is work that I'm doing with uh, Alina. Uh, Longiano, who's a PhD student uh, in technology and social behavior. Uh, Toshio and Dorothy are stu uh, postdoc and students at Georgia Tech. And uh, I forgot one name, the important person to mention here is Leslie the Church, who's on the faculty at Georgia Tech and uh, runs the lab where Dorothy and Toshio uh, are working. So here we wanted to look at the assembly of scientific research teams. So what we've been doing is we've looked at, we had for a short while, I was on the advisory subcommittee uh, at SAIS, at NSF, to uh, the Computing and Information Sciences Engineering Directorate. And we, for a short period of time, had highly secured access to data about funded and unfunded NSF projects. And here's what we found. I don't have a slide with this. I'm going to just say this orally and then talk about the ecosystem. What our first analysis was, how can we distinguish why people come together to write a proposal? What are the reasons why you join someone to write a proposal? And what are the reasons why when you join someone that well, some proposals are funded and some are not funded? So you can think of that as a performance measure. That at least they, uh, they at least the project was funded as opposed to unfunded. And what did we find? We basically found that people, we had several factors, but two factors that are network related that I'll touch on, is that people have co-authored with each other were more likely to submit a proposal. This kind of makes sense. You already have a history of working together. We also found that people who cite each other a lot are more likely to submit a proposal. Well, if I know what Ben does and Ben knows what I do, we've cited each other. We're more likely to know what each other does if you cite each other. And then we're more likely to submit a proposal.
proposal. However, then when we wanted to distinguish between successful and unsuccessful proposals, what we found is that in fact submitting a proposal with someone that you've co-authored with is actually going to make you 4.2 times more likely to be funded. So sending a proposal with someone you've co-authored with definitely is a good thing. However, submitting a proposal with someone you cite and who cites you reduces your likelihood of get, getting funded by 1.6 times. So you're less likely to get funded if you submit a proposal with someone you cite. You think, why is this possible? Well, it says that what happens is that when two people don't cite each other that much, it's because they represent two different intellectual communities. They're both citing their respective intellectual communities. And what they are doing is by their collaboration, they're bringing together recombinant ways of different pockets of expertise, thereby increasing the likelihood of coming up with an innovative proposal, which is meant more likely to get funded. By the way, we've borne this out now with some other work. We've been looking at NIH proposals as well. And so this is the kind of interesting finding that you can get by looking inside the team. Here, what I'm going to end with is how do you look outside the team? And what we are saying is you can think of the team as you have the four focal researchers, each of them a circle around the team. So now when you want to represent a team, you're not representing it by a bunch of lines, because that's the problem. If you're represented by a bunch of lines, you don't know whether the three lines between the three of us represents one team, or it represents a team of two there, a team of two here, and a team of two here. Right? So that's why you circle it, and that's what is called a hypergraph as opposed to a regular graph. And a hyper edge is different from a regular edge. And a regular edge, as Mark told you, is an edge between two nodes. A hyper edge can have connection between more than two nodes. It could be three, four, five, and so on. So here you see these hyper edges around these things. And the goal is to say, to what extent would I predict that these four people, based upon their overlapping team memberships with other people, are likely to come together? And then are they likely to be successful in this area? So, um, it says teams do not assemble in a vacuum, they're part of an ecosystem of teams, and there's just very little work that I have come across that looks at ecosystems of teams to see how that might explain the um, assembly of a new team. So we ask all kinds of questions here. What are the ecosystem characteristics that lead to team assembly? Are there a few key teams that dominate the intellectual discourse? In other words, how do we know that in a particular area, people are likely to submit proposals to go back to the NSF? What, what is about the existing set of teams that tells us, that signals us what's going to happen. The second is, are they, do they need to be part of a coherent neighborhood? Are proposals more likely to be written in areas where teams are already having a lot of overlapping uh, ties? That is, people are connecting to others who are already working together. So one member of one team is also another team. And then, how is the immediate local neighborhood? That is, of the team that is fund, sub submitting a proposal, is their immediate local neighborhood pretty coherent or is it, is it, are they highly embedded? That is, if three of us work on a team here. I'm more likely to work on our team if each of us belong to teams that has a lot of overlap with others of us who work on teams. So that would make us highly embedded. Is that more or less likely to increase the creation of teams? And what we found here is, I'm just going to jump ahead pretty quickly, what we found here is that there's some really interesting results that come out of this. I'm not going to talk about the statistics here. I'm happy to talk about it later on. We found that you're more likely to see proposals written or come together or papers for that matter written, this was actually based on papers written, that your papers are more likely to be written in areas, no, I'm sorry, this was on proposals, um, but NIH proposals. And so here what we found that more proposals come in a field where there's already some amount of general coherence. That is, you have some amount of connections between the people, there's a lot of overlap amongst the teams. The more overlap there is amongst the teams in a certain disciplinary area, the more likely it is that people will write proposals. It kind of makes sense because it says there is some intellectual coherence within this area and that there is a tipping point at which point it's more likely for teams to begin to emerge and more people to work because they think it's a legitimate area. I think just as our example of what we do ourselves, uh, I think the area of TMSP falls into that category. We have enough of overlap amongst the various people in this room. Bernie had some interesting network graphics of people who have collaborated with other people within this area. So we now know that through workshops like this, this field has a level of coherence where it's more likely that people will be submitting proposals or will be writing articles, etc. But that said, the second part of it is also interesting. And that is, you're more likely to submit a proposal and assemble into a team in a field that is coherent but you are more likely to be successful in the proposal being funded if your immediate neighborhood is actually less, uh, less uh, embedded than the larger area. So the larger area, you want it to be fairly connected so that you will have a chance, you feel legitimized about doing what you're doing. But your local neighborhood actually should be less connected so that you are brokering between groups that have not been connected together. 
that if you are highly embedded, then you're less likely to come up with a good idea because what you find is that you're surrounded by people who are in highly incestuous team relationships. So you want to be in an area that is somewhat connected, but your immediate neighborhood should be less connected than what is average on the outside. So again, these are kinds of findings that we've not thought about or theorized about before because we've not had access to these kinds of data before. I want to end by saying that we've talked about understanding. It's now time to talk about how can we take what we have learned in our research and help to enable TMSP. Uh, I was in a hurry starting coming out, so I haven't had a chance to um, fire up my browser, so it'll take a minute to do this. But I want to talk about how we've built recommender systems based upon these social network theories and research results that we have out here. So let me um, go back to it. So here is a research project where our goal was to try to take what we have done and build better networking tools for scientists to come together in research teams. So this is a, a, a website that we developed for people at Northwestern. It's for people who do work in the area of clinical and translational science. I need to move this back one. And uh, it's, a it's a recommender system. But it's a recommender system which is based upon taking data from each person, seeing all the articles they wrote. It's linked open data, so that makes it easier to do to work with this. And it's a research networking tool. And just like in Facebook, you get recommendations of who you want to be friends with, or on Amazon, you say if you're interested in this book, here are some other people you'd be interested. What we do out here is we try to build a recommender system for people who are interested in a certain topic and want to form teams. So here you look at the top, and I'm almost done, I think we're being on time. These are all the researchers who are part of this particular center on clinical and translational science. This is an NIH effort. So let's say I'm Xu Ping, and let's say I'm interested in some topic. I've already put the word brain, but if I didn't, you'd get autocomplete of all the keywords and the articles that any other people in the network wrote. So let's say we do stick with brain. And then I say, okay, what becomes interesting is how the recommendations are made. And you'll recognize some of this. You can ask for a recommendation by, by motivation. So self-interest is most qualified. Show me the most qualified person on brain. Or show me a friend of a friend. Or show me an exchange, the social exchange mechanism. Or birds of a feather, the homophily mechanism or mobilizing the collective action mechanism. So you can say, use one of each of those criteria based on where I'm in the network, and amongst all the people who are experts in brain, rank order them based on the criteria. Or you could use the I'm feeling lucky approach here. And the I'm feeling lucky approach is based on our statistical model, which remember our model said is a little bit of this, a little bit of self-interest, a little bit of homophily, and so on. So we run that model and come up with the best results based on the combination of these multiple motivations that might influence this. So this is now almost done with. You can look at a recommendation. I'm taking it here on the basis of most qualified. And so I chose most qualified here. And it shows me the names of the people. You'll recognize some are like Mark Williams, Ji Wang Chen. These are most qualified because either they wrote a lot of publications or the ones they wrote were cited a lot. Uh, you can then also click on why. Uh, this might take a minute because I don't know whether I launched the Java. Before that, there it is. So it puts me in the center there and shows me the people that are recommended and sized by the amount of citations they get. I can double click on this node and then it'll bring me information about that person. The nice thing is the information is bringing me about that person here, his co authors, his citations, and so on and so forth. It's based on linked open data. So we are not keeping the data centrally. Wherever the data might be, because there are links to these people, it's able to bring all that data in. And so that's the way in which we work, we work that recommender system. And of course, you do the same thing. You can say, well, it says that I cite him, but I'm not sure where I cited him. You click on that link, and it'll bring up, did it do it in another window somewhere? It would bring up the, um, the, the, the citation in front of you. Here we go. So there it is. It, it says, Zhu Ping cites Mark Williams, and it gives you the articles in which it was cited. So what is nice is it tells you it's able to take the knowledge we have from the kinds of theories we have. And this is a recommendation that is built for scientific research, but it's the same kind of situation that can be built in a lot of other contexts. Uh, and we're thinking about doing this one. We have a project we just got funded from NSF on to look at how to build up mentoring ties between practitioners, activists, advocates, and scientists, uh, women who are doing, uh, activists and advocates and scientists in the area of sustainability. So this, when we're building a recommender system along the same lines as this in that particular community. So again, to go back to the key takeaways, um, I hope that what I've tried to do during this, uh, this presentation here is, oops, sorry, is to say that we have been able to get a good point in time in terms of uh, helping assemble the next 
Watson team, if we may. And I'm not going to go into the details of these slides here, but as I was hoping you've seen here, is that we do have um, theories that we've already created, and new ones like the hypergraph that we have an opportunity to create. We have some really interesting combination of methods that we can use in this area. Uh, obviously, we have fantastic data, and I really recommend thinking more about the kind of work. Linked open data is one area. Many of you know that Google came out recently with what they call the knowledge graph or the knowledge net, which is a very similar idea. In fact, some of the people who have been studying semantic uh, tech, tech, web technology say, well, Google, the good news is, the bad news is Google stole our idea and gave it a new label. The good news is that finally it's getting some visibility. Uh, they've been talking about this quite unsuccessfully in the general public. And then finally, uh, we have uh, also, obviously, all of the stuff needs really high computational infrastructure in order to be able to handle this. So I will stop with that and acknowledge our funders, and thank you again. Great talk. We've got about five minutes for questions, and maybe Dave would like to set up while Marsh takes some, some questions for them. Who's going to be first? You can make up now. Yeah, a tremendous amount of content. Really wonderful example of how the network research ends up in a product that is really helpful to people and can be used across a variety of different disciplines. Oh, it's post lunch kind of tea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wait, I, I have a question about the diversity when we are talking about yeah. individual networks or individuals within the network and um, the World of Warcraft composition of the of guilds and um, you were talking about how diversity improves performance. Are we talking about user diversity or avatar diversity? Okay. And I know that's case, probably no, 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 no. It's a very good question. In this case, I I, I, I clarified it afterwards. So okay. uh, it was avatar diversity. Avatar diversity. So in other words, what we were saying is that there are people, those who may not be that familiar with the game, you have sort of four roles. You can have a mage or a scout or a priest or so. A fighter is somebody who goes on offense. Uh, you can have a scout who's good on defense. You can have a mage who's a magician who helps uh, give you medicine. The priest just heals you. And so having diversity of those characters mm -hmm. makes it. There's a whole part of work of literature in computer science, as it turns out, on what they call team chemistry mm -hmm. and its compositional work. Right. And they look, and some of you may be familiar with Shane Battier's effect. Have you heard of the Battier effect? Anyone in this room? It's a great example. You know Shane Battier, right? Mm -hmm. He used to play basketball at Duke. Uh, did very well. Mm -hmm. Went into the, went into, uh, the pros was heralded as going to be one of these fantastic players. Didn't do so well. People wondered why. Uh, and then there was this one guy who was a great fan of his who ended up going on and doing some additional statistics and found that while Shane's stats were not great, what he found is that the stats of everyone on the team were much higher when Shane was on the court than when he was on the bench. So these all this that's called the bad year effect. In other words, he's not good, but he makes everyone around him obviously much better. Right. And it's not just by assists. In fact, his assist score is not that high. And this got again another resurgence because this year, guess what happened? Shortly before Miami Pretty went well, into the finals, yeah, finals. He, he ended up actually moving to Miami. Miami couldn't win all these years without him. And then Shane shows up, and now they they got the uh, NBA championship this year. So so th those are the kinds of compositional issues. And so we've been looking at it even now. The net, uh, research on NSF proposals found women are not more likely to join teams overall than NSF ones. Right. But when women join teams, they are three times more likely to be a successful proposal than an unsuccessful. Proposal. Right. Which is which can there are two or three explanations for that, <laughs> but uh, one is well I think you discuss that later. But I mean you part of it ma part of what makes it easier seems to be that these are are tangible ways of being able to establish what the strengths and the yeah. weaknesses of each yeah. member of the team is, and yeah. there's no real I don't know how to say it, like like substantive way, no quantitative way to make those differentiations when you're talking about, would you like to write an article with me? Will you please give me a resume of, you know, your writing skills, your research oh, you ability. Oh, you have so much your, to learn. You know? You have so much to learn. We do that all the time, subconsciously or unconsciously. We are very cognizant about it. You see, what is that baseball movie about? Uh, Money ball. Money ball. Money ball. Right. So I, I actually would, I would say that maybe we don't do it consciously. But subconsciously, we are constantly evaluating and making judgment calls, and there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. to make judgment calls about who we team up with based upon those tangible attributes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that we do it. We do it. We, we just do don't it. have a quantitative. And we're getting there yeah. to do that as well. That's part of what I, that I, what I will argue is happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Thank you for wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, the scholars in your recommendation system are predetermined, right? Yes, they are part of uh, the, the boundary of the network. Is that asking how do you decide who's in the network? Yeah. These are all members of a particular center at Northwestern called NUCATS, the new Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Science Center. Oh. Uh, is there any way to yes. randomly select a scholar and put the name onto the system? Yes, yes. Good answer? question. So last year I spent a week at WebSharp, mm -hmm. at this WebSharp, and I was telling uh, earlier that I don't know how much you folks learn from the faculty, but I can tell you the faculty learn loads from you because you have so many insights <laughs> out here. So I can't believe they pay us to learn from you, and it's, it's because of these great opportunities. I bring this up now because today I said I'm not going to be able to stay, I'm leaving tonight. But I'm going, the reason I'm leaving tonight is that tomorrow I have a presentation that is about that topic. So we have now developed, and I didn't show it today yet, but we've developed a networking tool that allows you to go beyond your home institution. That if, if everyone is sharing their data about this kind of information in linked open data, so we are presenting tomorrow at a conference on linked open data and research networking um, in Miami. And it's a paper which says you can put it in, we've shown, we demo it with three. You can put in a keyword like brain, and it'll show you people in your own institution, Northwestern, as well as Florida and Cornell, both of which have now put their data in this linked open data format. So now the idea is that because of the standardization, we can scale this interconnectivity to any institution that shares its data in the linked open data format. There are some political problems because some of these citation data is in, op is, is in linked data, but it's not open data because it's provided by commercial companies like Elsevier and, and Thomson Reuters. So there are some gated community issues that come up in that case. But technologically, we are showing that at this talk that I'm giving tomorrow. So thank you for a great presentation. Thank you.